Good evening, and welcome back to the Poe Museum. It's with a heavy heart that I have to inform you that just last Christmas Eve here at the museum, our security cats, Edgar and Pluto, apprehended a fellow who is trying to slide down the chimney here. And before I was able to intervene on his behalf, the boys ate him. So I'm afraid there's not a whole lot left of jolly old Saint Nick. And that leaves it up to me to take on the mantle and take up the responsibility of spreading joy and cheer this Christmas season. And I begin with presenting you with the latest installment of The Curator's Crypt, which you could have already seen if you'd supported the Poe Museum at patreon.com slash Poe Museum. This afternoon, we're joined by my good friend, Pluto, the Poe Museum cat. And some visitors to the museum ask exactly why we named him Pluto. And that's because it's the name of the title character from Poe's story, The Black Cat. And here it is. This is the story from the 1845 first edition of Poe's book, Tales. And here's another copy from our collections. So this one also published during Poe's lifetime, but it's the second edition. This was published in 1848. And same table of contents, same title page, but it was a pretty good seller. This actually made Poe quite a bit of money. He got royalties. It was a 50 cent book and he made about eight cents for every copy that sold. So this made him enough money to furnish his house. And if you look at the table of contents, this is something that Poe really hated. He thought they didn't make the best selection on which of his tales to include, but it's mostly his detective stories. The Gold Bug, and The Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Mystery of Roger, The Purloin Letter. But the second story here is The Black Cat. It's a fairly recent one that Poe had published just a couple of years earlier, and then it was anthologized. And it's become one of his best known stories. If you haven't read it, it's a tale of a gentleman who loves his wife, loves animals. He has goldfish, dogs, a cat, even a monkey. He's a kind and gentle soul until he starts to drink. And then he sees a complete change in his personality. He becomes somebody that he hates and he does things that he hates because he knows he's going to hate himself for doing them. As he explains in the story, and then came as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philosophy takes no account, yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart. One of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. Who has not a, a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong thing's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. brute. And that brute is his beloved cat, Pluto as the man is overtaken by this dark inner self, this urge to do the wrong thing for the wrong thing's sake, he comes home drunk one night. And I think Poe says it best in the story. One night returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, 
I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him. When in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. Well, here is Poe's waistcoat. It came from a trunk of possessions that went to his mother-in-law after he died, and she passed it down to her niece, who passed it down through the family until it came to the museum. Never left the Poe family until it came here. So if this is his waistcoat, this is his waistcoat pocket. And this is Poe's penknife. So imagine him pulling this out of his waistcoat pocket. It's a lovely little piece with a mother of pearl handle, a silver plate on the side, with the name E.A. Poe engraved on it. It has two blades that fold out, and he could use these for sharpening his quill pen, for opening his envelopes, even sharpening his pencil. It's something that was really popular in the early 19th century and sort of fell out of favor by the mid 19th century. So imagine this is the kind of knife that Poe had in mind when he was riding the black cat. With quill pins falling out of favor, Poe turned mostly to using a steel-tipped pin and wouldn't have really needed the pin knife anymore, but still a very nice piece, a luxury item, probably worth quite a bit. So he pawned it, or basically he exchanged it for a loan. There's a fellow Thomas Richmond who loaned him a little bit of money and Poe gave the pen knife to guarantee that loan. Poe was forever borrowing money. He always had a business plan in mind. He was trying to start his own magazine and this probably would have helped him out quite a bit. And Thomas Richmond, his first cousin was Charles Richmond who was married to Annie Richmond up here. Now, Annie was a very close friend of Poe's. He met her after his wife's death. She was about the same age as his wife was when she died. And he just fell head over heels for Annie. He started writing her poetry, including the poem For Annie, with those classic lines, the fever called living is conquered at last. He thought she was the perfect woman for him, but of course, she was still married, so it wouldn't have really worked out. But even at the end of his life, even after he'd been engaged to two other women, was currently engaged to Elmira Shelton. He wrote to his mother-in-law, says, can I really be happier here in Richmond? Or I must be up north with Annie. I must be near Annie. I cannot bear to hear anything about her unless it's her husband's finally died. So I think Poe never quite entirely got over Annie, but it's a great connection between the pen knife and Annie and the story of the black cat. So let's finish up the black cat. Now, after plucking out the cat's eyeball with a pen knife, our narrator hates himself. He's disgusted with himself. And eventually he tries to win back his cat's trust. Finally, the cat forgives him, but in another fit of rage, the man hangs the cat from a tree and kills him. At that point, the man's house burns down that very night, and he finds on the one remaining wall the outline of a black cat. And it may seem like something supernatural, but he tells himself, no, this is just maybe somebody outside was trying to wake us up, alert us to the fire, and they threw the cat into the wall and left an impression in the plash of the wall. So it's something that has a perfectly normal explanation, for Poe at least. In Poe land, that's a perfectly normal explanation. And then the man goes back to his usual ways, drinking and carrying on, and another cat shows up, just like the first, except this one has a white patch that resembles the gallows, almost a reminder of what this man did to the first cat. And this other cat also is missing an eye, just like the first cat. He follows the man around everywhere, eventually takes him home, and again, the man loves the cat. His wife adores it. 
until the cat starts getting a little bit too close and once and once again the man is overtaken by this urge to do the wrong thing for the wrong thing's sake and at length he decides he has to go ahead and kill that cat so he chases around the house with an axe but then his wife gets in the way and says stop stop don't hurt the cat so he buries the axe in her brain and then you've got a problem pretty common to pose stories you have to find a place to hide the body so he takes it to the basement removes some bricks from the wall and then plasters up the wall, puts the body back there, and no one's the wiser. Eventually, people start to miss the wife, and the police are summoned, they search the house, and, and the murderer's gotten away with it. He's so proud, these, these days have passed without seeing his wife, the cat has mysteriously disappeared, and in, in the audacity of his triumph, He's gotten away with his crime. He actually goes to the very wall where he's concealed his wife and he comments on what great construction this is, how solid these walls are. And just as he's knocking on the walls, he hears from behind the screeching of the black cat. He'd actually put the wife back there with the cat. The police tear down the wall to find out her bloody, rotting corpse is back there with a cat sitting on top of its head. The man's busted. It's caught up with him. And if you read the story, you'll see that throughout it, there's nothing really supernatural going on. There's no ghosts, goblins, vampires, werewolves. Even the cat, they dismiss all possibility that, you know, it's, that it's actually supernatural. They just say, oh, it's just a coincidence. In Poe's story, just like in The Telltale Heart or in The Imp of the Perverse, the villain isn't from without, it's from within. It's our own urge to do the wrong thing for the wrong thing's sake, even if it leads to our own destruction. It's the evil within us. And Poe's story reminds us that even somebody very gentle and kind who loves his wife, adores his beautiful black cat, can go a little mad sometimes and do the wrong thing for the wrong thing's sake.